Hello and welcome to everybody again to Living on Music. I'm Steve Hauk and uh, we are here again on a Monday evening in 2021. Uh, living on music, either in our personal lives, here on the show, everywhere, trying to keep music going and engaging in, in the middle of all of your lives. And I hope that you have enjoyed the last 40 or so guests. And we have an incredible story to tell tonight. Um, if you see him behind me, you see PJ's. Uh, PJ's was a <clears throat> legendary jazz and pop music nightclub in West Hollywood during the 60s. Um, attracted a lot of film and TV personalities, and some incredible musicians. Um, it hosted bands like Cool and the Gang, Rufus Thomas, The Standells, Bobby Fuller, some of the older classic California musicians, and other performers like Flying Burrito Brothers, Tim Buckley, and people like that. But it also was the place where in 1962 or three, before it was released in 63, Trini Lopez recorded live at PJ's. And that album became a absolute staple of my life. My parents bought it probably when I was two or three and played it all the time through my entire single digits and into my teens. And it became one of the most fixtured albums in my brain. And that's why tonight's show is so unbelievably special. We have Joe Chavira on. Joe is a singer songwriter from California, um, has over 800 songs in his catalog, has done on-air commercials and stuff for people like BMW and Hearst Castles and worked with Kenny Loggins on a telethon and other things. Just an incredibly prolific guy. But five years ago, he bonded um, and collaborated with the legendary Trini Lopez. Um, and their story from 2015 when they met until 2020, when Trini passed away at the age of 83 in August of complications related to COVID-19, their story of bonding, of collaboration, of friendship, of a, a younger musician than Trini finding this legend who was a big part of his life as well. I helped him get through one of the most incredible tragedies you can imagine a family getting through and Trini's music was right there. So Joe Chavira on tonight, PJ's is so big, so very, very special show. So real quick, just wanted to, uh, mention one thing. Um, it's come to, it's been known over the last number of weeks uh, that one of the great venues in this area, Blues Alley, was um, on the verge of closing and um, <clears throat> trying to get some details on it. I know that there was a possibility it might be, be up and put on the market. There's a chance that it would be closed and try to be reopened in the third quarter of 2021. But that, that, that place is one of the most incredible places anywhere. Um, I have one memory of that place myself. I went to see Branford Marsalis and I went up to the bathroom, which you have to kind of weave upstairs to go to the restrooms in the Blues Alley. And I came out and couldn't help but noticing a door open down the hallway. And there was sitting there practicing some quiet notes was Branford Marsalis. And as I came down, I was looking in the door and he saw me and he opened the door a little wider and he said, Hey, how you doing? And I said, really good, Branford. And he goes, what are you doing? Uh, what's your name? We talked for five, 10 minutes up uh, in this tiny hallway at the Blues Alley. Been there a number of times. Uh, some of the great people like Patty Reese, Dave Chappell. Um, I can go on and on about people in this area who love to play uh, Blues Alley. We're really hoping that in one way or the other, Blues Alley remains going. But it's been a very, very difficult time for venues, as we all know. And Save Our Stages is hopefully going to help some people. But <clears throat> some people, they're they're already too far gone, and they, they might not be able to keep it. So see your cross fingers for Blues Alley. In the meantime, um, there's a great website called savemusicvenues.com. And basically, they're an apparel company created by Julian Frampton and Jeremy Harris. Um, in today's climate, you know, music venues are you know, the jeopardy of closing all the time. So 
they have put together where you can buy some products of their shirts, hoodies, masks, and 100% of the net profits proceeds, excuse me, go to a music venue of your choice. So when you buy something from them, and they have these great shirts, say save music venues, um, you will pick a venue. You could pick Blues Alley. You could pick Birchmere. You could pick 930 Club. You could pick anywhere you want, and they will send the proceeds to that venue. It's just a wonderful, wonderful um, organization. And uh, I encourage you to go to savemusicvenues.com and do your part to help save some of the amazing venues in this area. Well, from the day I was born, uh, back in, wow, March of 1961, uh, and yes, I'm coming up on my 60th, um, music was an absolutely central, integral part of my home, my heart, and my life. I mean, why else am I doing a show called Living on Music? Um, because I did, and I do, live on music. Uh, I didn't become a bona fide musician or singer till I was 46 years old, but as far as being music, as music being a part of my inner soul, um, it started in the womb of my mama. Uh, most of that credit goes to my parents, um, who had a plethora of varied and eclectic and remarkable albums my whole youth, from Broadway shows to rock and roll to jazz to Russian, folk to pop, and on and on. A few artists' albums were at the forefront of that. Um, Barbara Streisand, I remember, Glenn Campbell, Wes Montgomery, uh, Neil Diamond's Odd August Night, The Beatles, of course, the Broadway, Broadway version of West Side Story, um, among others, but none were probably as memorable to me as Trini Lopez's Live at PJ's, which came out when I was two years old. Um, but it, I mean, it went throughout my childhood. I mean, America, If I Had a Hammer, Lemon Tree, Bye Bye Blackbird, Granada, This Land is Your Land. You know, let's hear a minute of the record open right now, and, and it just gets me going. And now PJ's proudly presents Trini Lopez. <laughs> Yeah. I love to be in America. Okay, by me in America. Everything's free in America. Or a small fee in America. Yeah, that, I mean, it takes me back. It brings a tear to my eye uh, and it reminds me so much of my sweet late parents who used to dance in the living room of our barn in Connecticut to that song and that whole album of Trini's and I gaze in wonder and love at them with Trini in the background. Um, There's also another live at PJ's too. Now, not long before that album was released, my amazing guest tonight, Joe Chavira, was born. Um, today, Joe is an accomplished singer, songwriter, musician, a active performer who plays piano, guitar, drums, bass, has a career that to me never seems to slow down. Um, he's amassed a catalog of over 800 songs, has written promotional music for the likes of BMW, Hearst Castle, Universal Studios, and even Kenny Loggins' Unity Celebrity Telethon. He wrote the theme song, and you'll hear that in a little while. Uh, he's won awards, and he's moved people, I think. And that's one thing about Joe that I could tell with his emotional, no-nonsense, clarity-ridden, wonderful lyrics within his songs. Um, but in 2015, Joe met and began a spectacularly close and productive bond with, yes, Grammy-winning Grammy music legend, Trini Lopez. And over the next five years, Trini and Joe collaborated to co-write close to 50 songs, complete, oh, five CDs or so in nine months, have the Trini and Joe reality show. They would remain very close friends and collaborators uh, until, unfortunately, Trini passed away in August 2020 of complications from COVID-19. But a good chunk of tonight's episode of Living on Music will take you along for the ride with Trini and Joe. Um, overall, Joe has said that he considers each song he has written as a family member. Um, this is a man of passion with a big heart. You can tell by his music and by the way he, he lives and, and sings, and that is how Joe writes each and every song. Um, his childhood was one of trauma and, and fighting back from going the other way. And he got through. Um, it's a true story, as he puts it, uh, as he put it on a, a biography video of his family, of courage, strength, tragedy, death, victory, triumph, and family love. And that could describe much of tonight's conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Living on Music, Joe Chavira. Joe, what a wonderful 
experience having you. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Good to be on your show. Oh, it's so wonderful to have you here. I felt like I was immersed in your uh, your positivity and your wonder of, of what you've been doing um, over these last number of years. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. First, I just wanted to ask you, and I one day won't have to ask guests this, um, but how have you been doing as a musician, uh, as a very active guy? It seems like you've been very busy over these last 9, 10, 11 months of the pandemic. How how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, obviously, I'm, I was really hurt when Trini passed because my parents passed just before I met Trini. And so kind of started, he adopted me. He never had any kids. and you know, some people think I kind of look like when he was younger. So we bonded way further past the songwriting relationship and business agreements right. that we did. And it, we kind of were like friends, buddies, and then father, son, and how like have you that. been? Have so, you been doing since then? I mean, uh, him passing was a t another part of the pandemic that nobody really wanted to experience. But how have you been doing personally from a musical standpoint? I, it seems like you've been, again, real busy during this last number of months. Yeah, um, I call it speed bumps in life. I don't let them s slow me down. And because of the question you asked, we'll get, get into it later, but I had a car wreck when I was a kid. And it was pretty tragic. Maybe some people would take their life awkwardly, and I got more positive. When Trini passed away, just on August 11th, 530 in the morning, I got the phone call from his girlfriend and assistant, Orly, and we both broke down and cried that he was passed away. Um, so what I did is I wind up my rubber band inside myself, and I say, I'm going to make a legacy for Trini that was requested by his family. Uh, they told me he's worked with Sinatra, Elvis, everybody, but he really bragged about you on a personal note which is why I went to the funeral in Texas. It was a private funeral, but I was the outsider that they kind of adopted me. And wow. so I guess what I did is when he passed away, I got respectfully more aggressive to promote his legacy, the things we did, the stories, and my music as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, you, yeah. Released, a, you released a record or put out a record, finished a record during the during the last number of months, which is a, a neat achievement considering the incredible stress everybody's under, especially as musicians, uh, called No Reasons. What was the kind of the uh, motivation behind that? Well, um, like most people, I used to be married. I had a wonderful wife. Uh, I always speak good about her. We just married really young. We were really young and kind of went our different directions, but with all love to her as a... Thank you. To me, the way I think, the way I was raised, my dad says, treat a woman like a rose and they'll blossom when you give them honest love. So I wrote the song, No Reasons, to say thanks. It was a great thing. I just needed to move on. And that's what, and this is the first time I've ever told this story. This is going to be the first time I ever tell a lot of stories with you. So I appreciate that very much. My oh, ex-wife. That's that's beautiful. We were gonna do um you were gonna do a song I think from that record first um on guitar and that was uh, the song "Cause You're Mine." Is that also part of the uh, thread that you were just talking about a little bit? No, no. I really versatile on the album. Uh, they go left and right. Some are just made up from thoughts. When I play the piano, I always Steve. I always see a movie, <laughs> and I imagine wonderful things. I love to write ballads. I like to rock, you know, we could play it the Whiskey Go Go, but this song is just basically about honest love again, about a man. I always imagine, like, when I was in high school, you're slow dancing to Stairway to Heaven and, and the guy's singing to the girl. I thought, I'm going to write songs that the husband or the boyfriend sings to his wife or girlfriend. That's what Cuz Your Mind's about, appreciating that good woman. When you're down and you need someone And the loneliness inside yourself begins I will try to reach for you I put my arms around you, hold you through the night 
Cause you're mine Cause you're mine Cause you're mine That's beautiful, man. And, you know, that that does encompass a lot of you, at least what I've been able to detect over the last number of weeks doing my Joe Chavira uh, research. That's beautiful, man. I love that. Um, you also did some band stuff, which you do a bunch of. Um, you I've seen a bunch of clips uh, from this New Year's show, and I want to show everybody uh, before we delve a little bit into your background, before we get to Trini. Um you did a New Year's gig. Um, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, was it uh, it was was it solo to people? You went live on virtual, and who was the band um, that you had? With, who were those guys that play so well and, and also seem very animated and fun when you're playing too? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that was put together for the reason that don't let COVID stop your dreams. Respect it. Wear the mask. I'm 100 percent for that, but don't let it stop your momentum. So I did a Christmas special two weeks before that. And then I filmed a, a New Year's special three weeks after that. And we just filmed a Valentine's that will be air next week. But the New oh. Year's was brought together uh, songs from the album. And I had uh, a fantastic, incredible, I mean, incredible drummer, Gerald Purify. Now I was raised as a kid learning drums, jazz. My middle name's Stan after Stan Kenton. My oh, dad yeah. was a jazz drummer. Yeah. From, uh, Dave, Bru uh, Dave Brubeck's band, but like Buddy Rich, uh, uh, Gene Krupa, those classic drummers. The drummer I have plays everything, jazz, rock, pop, everything. So he's in that show, and he's also like a partner with me on helping me out in, on many other things with music. My nephew is playing the guitar, Daniel Miller, and then I have on the bass uh, was uh, Matthew, and uh, on the keyboard was John, and it was a great band. It was I kind of put together bands for certain events. So if it's like a TV special, I, I fit guys that fit that format. If it's a live show, I kind of find personalities that fit. So I don't really have the full band. It's basically like you know, like Elton John, maybe Eric Clapton. You you have your your sole proprietor, me. And then I pull in people that are talented. And sure. I love yeah, helping that, other guys to get recognized too. So no, I, lo I love that. Uh, that's done often. That's done often by singer songwriters, as you know. A lot of people who've been on Living on Music as well are they they have a central core to themselves and then they're able to well i love the way this looks this is a real fun and you do a little bit of theatrics at the beginning getting ready for it uh, we're going to step back uh, about a, a, i don't know not, not that long ago about a, a month ago to when joe chavira and his band were doing a little new year's rocking <laughs>
You guys hit it. That would have been. A, I would have loved to have seen that on New Year's Eve. I wish I'd known, um, being that I was home too and watching. Uh, you know, the uh, the dropping of the ball with nobody in Times Square. But that is that is great. When you mentioned uh, in a, before we looked at the video, I, I my Dave Brubeck grew up on my street in Connecticut, and I knew his son and went over to his house a couple of times. And what what an amazing guy! And to be able to refer to his any of his band members is a wonderful thing. Um, we're going to talk about twenty twenty one because you you are just a force to be reckoned with, my friend. Um, that's what I've seen, almost more than anybody that I can really. I've talked to about forty you know incredibly revered musicians around from the world and the Washington D.C. area, and not a lot have been able to kind of keep their spirit and their momentum going. So we'll talk a little about a bit about twenty twenty one in a second. Um, you grew up out in California, Santa Maria. Um, had wonderful parents that were influential to you and very supportive. Um, it seems early on there was some music in your life. Uh, talk a little bit about how the music kind of began to come into your life uh, early on, especially with a dad who played some skins. First of all, I want to tell the listeners, I think you have a great program and I like your personality and you're very professional. So I want to open up and tell you a little bit more about when I was a kid, uh, we were driving from Santa Maria to Pasadena, which is about a three, four hour drive. And we pulled off the freeway. Um, you know, we had a station wagon. There were six kids. And my mom was pouring my dad some coffee uh, in a thermos, pulled off the side of the freeway. And we got hit about eight in the morning by a drunk driver kid that hit us at 80 miles an hour. And it killed my sister, one year old, instantly on impact. The car blew up twice caught on fire. Everybody got out of the car with a lot of injuries except me. And my oldest sister, she never got out of the burning car. So from that, I was sent to LA and nobody could figure why I didn't have any cuts, abrasions. I never was thrown from the vehicle. I just, I don't know what happened, but I never moved. And from that, when we finally got back together with the family, because they were in the hospital for a while, my dad wanted to pick my spirit up. So he had this Slingerland drum, uh, jazz drum set in the front room. And he put on this album and said, hey, it's Trini Lopez uh, live at PJ. Oh. So yeah, I got on the drums and <laughs> started playing and singing to Trini. And uh, if anybody at that time would ask me, would, do you think it's gonna, it'll be a true story when you grow up, you're going to meet Trini, be a songwriting business partner? No way. but. No. Look what happened. It's stories and dreams do come to reality. So from that, 
uh, with the support of my mom. She was a great writer. And uh, my dad was a great jazz drummer. His occupation was launching missiles at Vandenberg oh. Air Force Base. He was a wow. retired, he was a, a veteran paratrooper in Korean War. Oh. And Trini Lopez and I had a lot in common right from the get go. His dad and him's from Texas. My dad's from Texas. His dad's hardcore, disciplined. My dad's hardcore and disciplined. Look sharp, do your best, be your best. And I right. try, I'm still doing the same thing he told me. So that led into wow. all my music of Sedina, learning the piano at my grandma's. Uh, my dad teached me drums at home. And in between that, grabbed a guitar and wrote tons of songs that came very easy to me. And I'm still doing it. Well, yeah, and Joe, you you said that you uh, found happiness when you were a kid singing around the house. Um, what artists did you sing as a little boy? Uh, do you, what were the what were some of the songs or some of the artists that you just ended up walking around singing? I love you, baby, and it was quite all <laughs> right. You know, from that to Trini Lopez, Sinatra, the uh, Beatles, totally the Beatles, um, Elton John. Man, that guy can sing and write. And then you progress into George Michaels. It's a shame he he passed so young, but what yeah. a talent of singing and writing. I admire highly, Steve, artists that write and sing because I believe when an artist composes a song and sings it, he's writing to the uh, arrangement of how his voice can project. And you're getting that true heart and soul of an artist when he writes his own song because the lyrics were born inside of him and he's given birth to the ears of everybody that listens to it. Right. Absolutely. Your discipline, Joe, started young. I mean, even looking at your kind of your grade school years and excelling in different sports, you you began Kenpo Karate and Karate in seventh grade, which is this fascinating martial art style. I guess it combines the five animals of Shaolin Kung Fu, I looked up and I'm like the core competency of Kenpo, the hard hitting. So you began the discipline continued even outside of music for you, it seems with sports and and some of that. Did that help your continued kind of core discipline? Yeah, it was. Um, and a funny story about that is Trini and I became like best friends and we told all kinds of stories. I asked him, what's John Lennon like when they played in Paris together, the Beatles? What's Dean Martin, like when he's eating, when he's drinking, you know, we talked about everything. So on the karate thing, I told Trini about karate and I taught him martial arts. And he asked me the same question, what made me do study martial arts? Well, I got jumped. I was playing basketball for a, a school to beat the other team. And I was the last guy getting out of the locker room. And they're like on the west side of the town and that they got... 11, 12 guys around me in the locker and gave me the death threat, oh. you know. And yeah, and I, I came out of the locker <laughs> and my dad, you know, hardcore paratrooper, where the heck you been? I go, I'm stuck in the locker. I couldn't get out. I mean, they took my watch and he says, did you hit him? I go, hit who? There's 11 of them. He goes, darn it. He says, you should have hit the first guy closest to you. They would respect you. You better do something about it. That night, wow. that was on a Saturday morning game. I never forgot it. Um, my buddies go, God, Joe, what are you going to do? Happened on Saturday. On a Tuesday, I was at James B. Lee, Kimple Karate. <laughs> my black belt. Oh, <laughs> so my God. What happened was I trained fast and hard to protect myself. And then I got in a weightlifting team in eighth grade, and I just – and I was already in sports. So I, that's the reason I took karate and it disciplined me in everything. So I kind of look at Yon Q, San Q, and EQ, EQ Showdown. Those are the ranks of black belt and Kempo. You have to study, memorize moves, theory, spar, break boards. And now that I'm doing the music thing, it's the same thing. I think for everybody, there's always levels of a black belt in real estate, tinning windows, radio DJ, you want to get that next rank. So when I told Trini this, he said, oh, he always goes like this. And I, I used to always make them laugh because I'd imitate him. Perfect. He goes, oh, well, you know, it's funny. You got jumped by a gang and 
uh, you learn karate because I used to be in a gang. Oh, I go, you're God. in a gang? He goes, yeah, it's funny. You were, <laughs> he says, in Texas, where he was born, uh, raised and born, it was tough. And he was in a gang for a little bit, and we just laughed about it. He didn't do anything weird, really weird, but. Maybe that's, why, maybe, that. maybe that's why they picked him for that role in Dirty Dozen because he had the gang nature. <laughs> that's, was, that, I love that. He well, was a quiet, tough guy. Really quiet, tough guy. Yeah, uh, I, believe, I, be, I, I believe it. Um, you, you were Joey the Jet, which I love that because of your speed. And it, it actually follows you, it seems, with your speed of turning things around in music. I mean, 2020 alone was a blur and it's just incredible that you did all that. Uh, around in the early eighties, after high school, you earned your second degree black belt and won a state championship, which is just a phenomenal achievement. We just saw it there. You also formed, was it your first rock band? Uh, was that Kumate? Which in our, I guess that means to spar and go forward in, in martial arts. So was, was Kumate, is Kumate the right way to pronounce it? Yes, it's Kumate. And in a karate tournament, there's two events. One's kata, and you do these movements. The other one's kumite, and that's where you spar and fight. And so I thought, when the ref tells you to bow to each other, he gets between you and he goes, kumite. So I thought, what a great name. Oh, it's, <laughs> good. it's great. And, that, and, and that, was your first, um, that was your first kind of jump into actually having your own band? Well, no, I, I kind of... From like grade school, I always wrote music and I got in little bands in the garage. And uh, my first song I kind of wrote, I guess, was for this girl that was the most prettiest girl at uh, tunnel school I went. And I remember I loved singing so much. I In the bathroom, we had to, you know, take turns in the bathroom with six kids. I'd go in there and I wrote a song as quick as I could. And I went to school that day and I sang it to her. And, and she just loved it. And from that point on, I thought, that's a good way to make it work, write music. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm still writing tons. And the jet thing is, when football and karate, I ran really fast, and they called me Joey the Jet. And my friend said, you're still running with music. So, Yeah. No, I noticed that it, it it it's it definitely fits. There's definitely a a collaboration between your youth, it's Joey to the Jet and and Joe Chavira of of these days. Music began to kind of kick in, I would think. Um, it, it had been going for a while. You had your small bands. You had Kumate. When did things really start start picking up? I know there were some things that that began with telethons and things. Give me a little bit of a a capsule through like the '80s um, and into the '90s about what Joe Chavira was doing musically. Okay, that's a great question. Um, all through high school, I was always writing songs, tons of songs, but I was playing football, karate, and track, and those guys weren't like that. So I just kind of stashed them away and never tell nobody and it accumulated 200, 300 to 800. We did Kumite as a, as a rock band, like kind of like Red Hot Chili Peppers slash, I don't know, uh, the Beatles. And... Then I ended up singing on Kenny Loggins' Unity Telethon. Um, oh. The great cast to help families, clothe families and feed them. They had David Crosby, uh, Christopher Cross, Livy Newton, John, Kenny Loggins, tons of people. And so the first year I went on, I was nervous. I mean, sure. <laughs> and they go, oh, what are you going to do? So I sang a song and I got done and. A lot of the celebrities patted me on the back and said, wow, that's great. What are you doing your music? And I was kind of, I went on to that show thinking, don't ask for favors from these people. Just do your stuff and leave. And I, I kept building up a, a good resume and respect with them. And every year, I remember David Crosby telling me one year, you got a lot of great songs and you got a good singing voice. What are you doing with it? Wow. Um, I'm just doing it. And then that led to the Whiskey A Go Go to play yeah. headline. And then shortly after that, I met the legend, Trini Lopez. Now, my report card was pretty good because uh, seven shows, I became an ambassador with Jeff Bridges. Kenny Log was on that show. I wrote the theme song. And then yeah. when Trini met, he asked, you know, do you really write that many songs? And then we connected. Boom. 
Yeah, I'm sure you. I'm sure that was a major part of it because of your songwriting. Um, we're gonna uh, get to Trini in a second for sure. I wanted to play a little clip of this uh, th song you wrote. This is from what Joe was just talking about, the Unity uh, Telethon. He wrote, got a chance to write a theme song for this thing, and it's a beautiful, right straight down the the, the center song. That's beautiful. Um, a little bit of Unity. To provide for their own children During difficult times A world without hunger And the toys of food Oh, uh, sweet. Those guys really, you know, really play. You guys played really well off each other. The four of you singing that, that was, that was really, really neat. Um, your musical career continued to develop, continued to go on. Um, you basically had some wonderful kind of relationships. You wrote a, uh, commercial, was it a music commercial for BMW? What was the, what was the project with BMW, which is a pretty universal brand? Well, what I did with BMW is I, uh, we had a discussion about, obviously selling more BMWs. So I went in at a meeting and I said that if we, a song always reminds everybody of where they've been. So I wrote this song called Destiny and I thought, I turned it like a little marketing thing. I wrote it, sang it, produced it. And then I said, when people come in and they shop for a BMW, what do you guys do? You hand them a business card and a brochure and they leave, right? They go, yeah, what's your idea? I said, well, hand, hand, hand them a singing, business card, which is a song. It was like a little uh, envelope that big with good packaging of their company, open it. It had all their information, but there were the songs that I sang reminding the art, the uh, customer when they leave to buy a BMW and it was really successful. That's oh, isn't that? BMW. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that what a great idea. That's uh, that's innovative of you. Um, how wonderful. And BMW isn't a bad <laughs> brand to uh, to be associated with it all. So as your musical career for Joey the Jet cont continued to uh, to stream through, um, what was going on with you uh, as the as we went into a new century in the beginnings of the two thousands with Joe Chavira and, and music? Well, um, the two thousand thing was doing a lot of uh, like the concert we were talking about for Unity. The sold out one, it sold out in like two weeks and it had a beautiful theater called the Clark Center. And I decided to do a, a huge benefit to give to Unity again to help them out with uh, money, it's just mm -hmm. about money. We performed, uh, sold it out quick, donated all the money there. We had a nice video of what the event was about and got a standing ovation. That was really cool. It saddens me and it makes me happy because my mom was there. And it was the last time she saw me perform. And the cameras followed me, I didn't know. And I announced after singing a ballad, oh, there's a special lady out in the audience that had a dozen roses. And everybody <laughs> in the band is looking like, you're not dating anybody right now. I, I never heard of it. And I go, there's a special woman out there. And I want to say thanks to her because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be here. It's my mom. So I oh. walked down, I walked down the steps and the camera followed me. There's three, four cameras, I guess. And it was beautiful because my mom stood up like in the third row and I gave her a kiss and I handed her the roses and that like, you know, 
and, uh, happy to her. But then I went back up and sang, and that was really meaningful for me. It was the last time, you know, we were together. To show she saw me sing. Oh, that's that's beautiful. It was that next number of years. Um, uh, you did some. Well, actually, in in 2011, um, you did a sold out concert. You said was that the one you were talking about? Yeah, that the the Unity Show. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you lost your dad in 2008 um, to cancer. Um, wrote a song that I listened to, which was very poignant. You can go online, everybody, on YouTube to jo Joe Chavira Music and find a plethora of videos and stuff that are kind of encompass Joe's world. But um, there was a beautiful song you wrote you wrote Joe about your dad called Today, and we're going to play a little bit of the one you wrote as a tribute to your parents in a second. Um, your mom, uh, about seven years later, who you were just talking about, um, uh, giving her those beautiful roses passed. Um, you had a video posted that I think is one of the most beautiful things I think I've ever seen. Um, and it was very kind of brave and courageous and, and, um, forthcoming of you to, to do this. Um, did you plan to go in to that hospital room where your mom was, oh. you know, coming, coming close to the end and sing her that beautiful song? Yeah, well, um, what that was about was uh, I we didn't think she was going to make it. So I just thought I'd sing to her. And I um, there's actually two videos. I uh, I sang to her with my acoustic guitar. I'd spend the night there sometimes two nights in a row. Sometimes I'd stay there all day because I didn't know if she was going to pass. And I had my acoustic, I'd sing to her at night because the doctor said she's in a coma, she had an aneurysm, she could still hear, but she's not responding at all. So I would sing to her. And uh, one of the times, now this is, this is amazing. The doctors at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital said she's not responding anymore. There's no physical movement at all. So I said, oh, whatever. Life support in her mouth. So I, um, I sang to her and I held the, the cell phone like right here and uh, in the middle of singing to her, I, I, I was that close to work with Trini and I told my mom, uh, I'm going to be working with Trini, you're going to be proud of me. And I started singing Heaven's Eyes, a song that I wrote with Trini uh, to my mom. Yep. And, and she opened her eyes. It's all on a cell phone. And she opened her eye and cried. And the doctor said that she'd have no movement. So it was uh, miraculous that that happened. So I, out of respect, I posted her in memory of my mom. That's well, here's that is beautiful, Joe. Uh, here's something that uh, I think is going to move you all. This is that moment, uh, where Joe wrote this beautiful song, um, on the bedside, and boy, did she react beautifully. This is Joe and his mother with Heaven's Eyes. Hey, mom, I'm gonna sing you a song. February 27, 2015. And I want you to open your eyes, okay? All right, can your eyes open, you know? I woke up in the morning thinking of you. I know I saw your heaven's eyes. I went to bed last night just thinking of you. I know I saw your heaven's eyes. Now I can see the way I felt before. And yes, I know this must be more. Heaven's eyes, I see it in you. Heaven's eyes, it comes out in you. Heaven's eyes, it's something so true. Your eyes are opening, and just about the time I gotta hold you, seems like you magically appear. Look at your eyes open, Mom. I talk about your love and your beauty. When I look at you, I see heaven's eyes. Mom, I love you. Your eyes are opening. I love it. And that album that me and Trini Lopez are working on, you're going to be so proud of me because when, when we're finished with it, you're going to hear it. And you'll be wide awake from your coma, okay? Look, Mom, your eyes are opening. I love you. Can you hear me? Heaven's eyes, I see it in you. Well, you don't get more 
incredible than that. I, uh, no words really express the beauty of that, Joe. So it just shows kind of your heart and soul too. Um, she passed. Um, your beautiful parents are always going to be in your heart and soul. So I feel the same. I lost mine 16 years ago and um, uh, I'm right with you. Um, you wrote a song uh, that was a tribute to your parents uh, called Pray Alone. Um, what was the, before we show a couple of minutes of that beautiful song, what was the impetus be behind that? Probably pretty straightforward about them and about where you felt. One word, respect. Everybody should have respect for their parents. And um, I wanted to, it was a challenge song too, because I wanted to do acapella. And that's pretty much what it is. Just my voice with some beautiful pictures of people that have passed that everybody in this life could relate to. I love it, man. Well, let's take a little ride with Joe and a beautiful tribute to his uh, as he has quoted a num numer numerous times in our notes and uh, other places, his incredible parents. This is a tribute to them and pray alone. And now, cold on my knees, my head is bowed. My eyes close to see all the blessings you have kindly given me. And every day our souls breathe light. Memories shine away. Well, you got me thinking about my folks, Joe. Uh, I thought that when I first saw the song. So thanks for that. And I'll, the end of the thanks, uh, the second decade of uh, the 2000s, you went through some tough times losing your folks and stuff. But uh, something happened um, that would probably change your life uh, in a lot of ways, just with the enrichment and the excitement and the, you know, the utter, it, it, just so incredible that you and I, in, you know, in different times, and we're about the same age, um, had Trini's music as part of our youth. I mean, it kind of got you out of a, a huge tragedy that you went through, right, kind of almost immediately. Uh, and it seemed to have spurred you on a little bit away from from the the darkness of that. And it it sat with me for the rest, for my entire life as a musician and as a music writer and, and things like that is, you met Trini Lopez uh, in 2015. Uh, give us a little bit of a nutshell uh, before we kind of roll into a little bit of the the, you know, what happened in those five years, um, those incredible five years that you and Trini collaborated. How did you guys meet? How did that initial meetup happen? He was at the Indian Wells Resort in uh, 
La Quinta area, Palm Springs, where he lives. Um, I heard about it. I was invited to go watch. He won an award, probably a lifetime achievement award. He's won so many. And Trini once told me when he was in Texas before I made it, all he wanted to do is see Frank Sinatra in person. That's it. That's what I felt. And so I just went just to like at a far distance go, oh, I saw him. And at the end, he walked towards me with his entourage of people. And he's really a funny guy. He, he always called him like a Robin Williams. And he walks <laughs> up and and I just said, I go, hey, uh, I mean, this is a guy who was on the Dirty Dez and worked with Sinatra. Beatles opened up for him. I mean, this is Trini Lopez. And I just go, uh, it's just an honor to meet you. That's it. Like, then I'm out. And he goes, oh, yeah. It's, somebody told him he writes songs, Trini. And Trini goes, he always moves his head and jerks around. He goes, oh, yeah? How many songs? And I go, uh, 800. And he looks at me like, hmm. And I said, no, I really have. And right then on the spot, <laughs> he points at a piano in the lobby as a, a grand white piano. And I, he said, play it. So I just belted out a couple songs. Everybody clapped. He got his card and he put his cell number on it. And he, he stuck it in my pocket and he goes, it's probably the same shirt. <laughs> I don't know. And he, goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, you want to make history? And I go, yeah. And he says, let's talk. And I didn't tell anybody because, you know, the deal, you yeah. tell all your friends and then it never happens. And like, yeah. So mm -hmm. I waited and about a week, week and a half. Uh, we spoke on the phone and he said, Do you really write 800 songs? I said, yeah, I, the words, the music, the play of our instrument. And we got together and I never forgot. He lives in this beautiful, beautiful home on Abrigo Street in Palm Springs. Elvis is right down the block, his second home. Uh, oh. Everybody lives right in that block, and I'm driving up there, and he comes out to help me get my guitar and whatever I brought, and he goes, what's that? And it was a box in my trunk, you know, <laughs> of 800 songs. And he goes, I go, that's the songs. I didn't want you to think I was exaggerating. I, I'm old school. My dad taught, taught me to tell the truth. He goes, oh, you didn't have to do that. But he goes, I'll take them. So he took the songs in and, you know, I didn't play 100, but we played a few. Then, boom, we started writing music, and it was like oh. two or three songs. And then it, he said, hey, do you want to do more? And then he said, you want to do an album? And when you walk in his house, Steve, it's like a rock hall of fame. Every well, wall has pictures, gold records, Elvis, the Beatles, the presidents. It's, it's a museum. Well, and hold I'm, hold that hold that thought, Joe. I'm going to show something, and we'll jump right back in a second. You you have a wonderful little video of Trini's house where you're standing, and and he describes a couple of pictures, and I love it. You the the, the kind of the adoration in your face and the way he talks. This is our our first look at Trini and and Joe in Trini's house for a little Trini Lopez house tour. How you doing, Trini? Okay, man. Welcome to my home. Thank you very much. Uh, we're here at my house in Palm Springs, California, everybody. And Joe wanted me to pinpoint a couple of nice, interesting pictures. That's a picture of Sinatra, Sammy, and Dean. I was at a big show with them in St. Louis, Missouri. It was a great show. Ella Fitzgerald was in the show. Count Basie, the biggest stars, man. It was great. And uh, this is a show I did with Dean Martin when he had his TV show. Dean was a great guy. He was such a nice person. And this is the first time, this is the first time that I met Frank Sinatra when he was doing a movie called Four for Texas. It was a Western, that's why he's dressed like that. And he wanted to meet me and uh, uh, he, he didn't say hello. He just looked at me, I came over to the set. He had he extended his hand and he said, Trinity Lopez, you're a great artist. <laughs> and he is. <laughs> Well, Joe, you know, again, that had to be such a thrill for you, uh, knowing him, you know, I mean, even if you hadn't known then this, this old legend guy had been like, hey, sure, you know, when you want to do some stuff, you kind of knew what he was all about. And then it just expanded, didn't it, once you guys got to know each other? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we hit it off like uh, like high school buddies, kind of like it was that quick, that fast. But I always heard that and he, we'd have dinner always at 530, always at 530. Uh, his girlfriend Orly and I and Trini would go and you know he, they tell me every story you can imagine 
from Sinatra to the Beatles. And she says, you know, he loves the world. Trini loves the world, but he trusts hardly anybody. And I go, oh, so I'm sitting there eating my food thinking, what does that mean? She goes, and he really trusts you. And he's sitting there going, that's right. <laughs> and I, then I started, I started imitating him. I go, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we were just that, I think I was probably the only one that screwed around like that with him, which made right. him feel like, oh. drop his guard. And he always get two beers whenever we order food. And it's, I always crack a joke to the waitress and, he get two cold Budweiser and he go on the side of his cheeks. And I thought he was doing it when he first met me as a joke. And he always does that. So that was the beginning of a lot of fun. We built trust, friendship, family backgrounds are identical, Texan fathers. Um, and then on top of that, I had a catalog of 800 songs and 50 more than him and I did. And then oh. ideas after ideas, we... Everything I, every time he'd call me, he'd say, what do you say? What do you know? What do you know? What do you say? Every time oh, I'd yeah. go, hello? He goes, what do you know? What do you say? What do you know? What do you say, Joe? And I'd go, I'd always do this voice to him. I'd go, okay, Trini, it's your amigo, <laughs> Joe. And he'd laugh his head off. And I'd always go, oh. and we were like, screw around buddies. And I think that's why everybody would ask, how did you guys get so close? I just was me and he liked it. And yeah, we had the music to it up, but like Trini says, you can meet some top musicians and all the years he was world touring. He says, you meet great guys, but they got problems. Some of them, you know, substance problems and some they're hard to work with. And then you meet guys that are really nice and friendly, but they're not that talented. So somewhere between that, I fit and I got his respect. And that's why the magic happened. All of it. Yeah, you could see it, Joe. When uh, And all the little, we, we've got a couple of, a bunch of really sweet clips that show that uh, kind of togetherness that you guys had. Uh, in 2016, um, you guys took a, a trip, 42 hour flight to Sri Lanka. How did that trip get booked in, in Sri Lanka, a sold out concert? Um, that must have been an, a wild thought to, to be going there and playing a gig. Well, Trini gets this phone call uh, from promoters in the country of Sri Lanka, which the city is called Colombo to do a concert. So he calls me up and, what do you know? What do you say? What do you know? I go, what are you doing? He goes, you got a passport? Uh, I'll get one. He goes, we're going to Sri Lanka. And I like honesty. I don't know where Sri Lanka's at. And some people that are world knowledge, I'm not. Well, I thought it was Ireland. You know, Sri Lanka. <laughs> like, and I go, oh, yeah, yeah. I go, we're going to Sri Lanka. And then I got my passport and I, Where's Sri Lanka? Joe, it's like past Hong Kong. It's like India. So we got on a plane, and it was 42 hours round trip. Woo! I wrote songs Ooh. on the plane and watched a lot of movies. We told a lot of jokes. Um, we get there at midnight. We're welcomed by the press, a lot of people, a lot of fans, pictures. We rehearsed the next day, and then the day after that, we performed the concert. And it was memorable. It was like Beatlemania. It was hard to hear ourselves singing. I always remember the Beatles saying at Shea Stadium they couldn't even hear themselves. It was yeah. kind of like that, you know. And and before we got on stage, we always would high five. And and there's a video clip somewhere, pictures of us doing it. And he goes, "How do you feel?" I go, uh, "Nervous." He goes, "Good, because that'll make you sing better." And he goes, "Walk out there, Joe." So I walked out a few feet and I. I looked around and woo, I went back in and um, I said, you ready? And I'd always do this to him with the Elvis thing. Come on, man. We got to do it, man. Got to do this show, man. And we get all pumped up. <laughs> and then I know not to do the voice thing on the stage because I could always make them laugh by doing that. Okay, Trini. So we did this thing, got off, signed autographs, and it felt like a cloud of like, and one thing about Sri Lanka, though, I told Trini about my mom passing and I missed her. I go, I wish she would have lasted a little bit longer to watch me do this. And he said, Joe, um, she could see you. And oh. so after the concert, I we had a party at the Hilton, which is where we might I might go back there. They're talking to me now to to perform a, a show inside their banquet room. 
at the Hilton in Colombo. But uh, I get to my room, Steve, and there's a number 15 on the door. I took a picture of it. And after the show, I was happy, but I was kind of, you know, missing my parents. I wish they could have saw me because my dad loved Trini. And uh, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, my, my mom passed in 2015. The mortuary and the cemetery ended in 15. The car accident that we had, our address was 615. Uh, I come to Sri Lanka and the room, I'm thinking of my mom, I took a picture, it's something, something 15. And he goes, you know what, Joe? I gotta tell you something. I'm born, I'm born on May 15th. I go, what? He goes, it was meant to be that we we're supposed to get together. And that's why I wrote a book that he signed a paper saying meant to be. So I'm going to name, you're going to be the first one to hear this. My next album, possibly I'm going to name it Joe Shavera 15 to attribute oh. to, to my mom, you know, all that. Yeah, that sounds like that would that would fit beautifully. Um, 15. Oh, gosh. We're gonna take a little bit of a trip. People get to go along with you guys and check this out. You're gonna you're gonna start on the plane with Trini and Joe. Then we're gonna see a couple of minutes of some of their time in Sri Lanka. What was your last name? Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I drop that? <laughs> I thought it was a trash can. Is that milk? Is that your glass of milk? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Take a picture like this. Okay. Hear your drink okay, before you drink. Hold it. Hold it. I'm in Cagdido. Hello. Hey, what? Look, look at the look, look at Kayang there. Oh, hello. How about that? You saw your yeah. newspaper. Hello. How you doing? You. Hello. Yeah, that had to be what a blast. Long way to go, but hey, if it's if, if you get out there and get to play with Trini Lopez in front of a sold out crowd, could be anywhere in the world, uh, and it would be phenomenal. That's fantastic. Um, you guys continued to develop this relationship. Um, we're going to show a, a, a couple of wonderfully fun, short little kind of bloopery clips of the two of these guys. It just shows it looks like they're uncle and nephew, you know, brothers, father and son. They just There's a thing going on between the two of you. Um, and then we're going to jump into, in a minute, uh, a, a clip that I loved where Santa wore a sombrero is such a sweet clip of the two of you on your reality show playing. Um, how, did the, uh, how, did the, how did the beginnings of the, of the kind of the doing these video projects, because a lot of people who were, you know, in their 80s aren't really up for that. It seems like Trini was totally into this entire thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> Jim Powers at Palm Springs Life magazine, it's a very prominent magazine, wrote a story that said at 81, uh, making history at 81, Trini Lopez collaborates with songwriter Joe Shavira. That said it all because Trini retired in, in 1981. And I came around at the right time and I, I juiced him up and he juiced me up from 
a legend working with him. So we would come up with constant promotions. The attorney always said, promote, 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 videos, videos, pictures, pictures. So we did all kinds of stuff. We made up home commercials in his house. Uh, there's a really cool one where we're both wearing a sombrero, holding a paper. And I just made the skit up, and he went along with everything. So we're holding the paper, the magazine, the newspaper, and it's really us on the paper. And all he sees is two sombreros and or black hat things he wore. And I go, hey, man, I read something about some guy named Trini Lopez and Joe Chavere. You know anything about it? He goes, no. Who, who is it? And then we pull the paper down, and we're both wearing sunglasses going, oh, it's us. Hey, wow, <clears throat> I'm reading something here, fantastic in newspaper. You know that? Really? Yeah. What, what does this say? Trini Lopez and Joe Schreier have this brand new album called All Original Songs. All right. All right. Guess how many songs? Yeah, I heard it was 18. 18? Wow. That's All a, Originals? Oh, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of songs. And also, too, I heard that you sang reggae, ballads, rock, Latin. Blues, blues, blues. Yeah. So we did a reality show, and we thought our names it fits perfect. Trini and Joe reality show. And we talked about how we write songs. We went to Catalina on a private yacht, and and filmed us walking around, mostly about how we wrote the songs, why we wrote them. People from around the world would write to us and ask questions like, "Why did you guys write that?" or "Who sings?" Who writes the words? Who writes the music? And we would trade off because Trini played a little bit of piano. People didn't know that, but there's some videos of me and him in his house where he's playing piano and I'm doing the guitar. But the reality show is based off another, hey, Joe, let's do another thing. So that came out and it was fun. Oh, uh, and then that's, we had the under that, that's the underlying word is fun and chemistry. Uh, that's what I love about you too. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to continue to belabor this. Well, maybe I will. That whenever I'm seeing this and it's Trini Lopez with you, I mean, you're an amazing guy anyway. And then you got him with you. I mean, I'm like, what? It's Trini. I mean, he was such a central part of my youth. And I, yeah, I just love every second of this. This is a little bit of a ride through some of the fun little moments that Trini and Joe had um, a couple of fun bloopers as they were doing some plugs, uh, some laughing, unplugging a record. And then we're going to, uh, we'll jump at the end of that into um, a wonderful little clip of Joe and uh, Trini on their Trini and Joe reality show uh, doing a little bit of Santa wore a sombrero, but this is a little bit of the chemistry between Joe Chavira and Trini Lopez. Hey, what do you know? What, uh, what do you, what, what, what do you say? <laughs> what, what, whatever. <laughs> One, two, three. Hey, what do you know? What do you say? What do you say? What do you know? Welcome to the Trinity Show. <laughs> I heard a rumor. What's that? We, uh, some guy named Trini Lopez and Joe Chavira did an album. You heard anything about it? No. No? No. It, it, were you involved with it? Am I involved? Yeah. Why, why should I? <laughs> It's an album, 18 oh, songs. Oh, yeah. Is it a rumor or is it true? Oh, it's true. No way. Yeah. Where are they at? Where do they live? Who lives? Where does, where does who live? The album doctor. <laughs> it's coming out. 18, what's the song called? All? All original songs. By, by, written by you and me. Yeah. By me and you. Yeah. Or me and him. Yeah. Or you. Yeah. Or yes. <laughs> Watch it. All original songs. Buy it soon in the store near you. You better. Thank you. Hi. Joe Shavir with Trini Lopez. Welcome back to the Trini and Joe reality show. 2017, we're in the late part of October. So, as we were discussing before, we're going to talk about the Christmas CD that can be purchased now on trinilopezmusic.net. Trinilopezmusic.net. But what we're going to do in this little segment is do what? A little teaser. A teaser. <laughs> a teaser of the song that's called Santa wore a sombrero. And if everybody knows, Santa's not from the North Pole originally. He's from somewhere in Mexico. North of Mexico. <laughs> and before he wore a Santa's hat, what did he used to wear? A sombrero. Yeah. Did you guys know that? Well, now we're going to tell you in a song how it all came about. And here we go. Here's a little teaser. you a 
story about Santa Claus. He was born in a city north of Mexico. He had a lot of good friends and time to say ho ho. Santa learned how to dance and wore a sombrero. Yeah, he would laugh and sing and always loved to make cool toys. You could do the salsa dance and a pet reindeer that flew. Yes, it's true. Santa wore a sombrero. Yes, yes, it's true. Santa wore a sombrero. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. Santa wore a sombrero. I like her very much. Yeah, no chemistry there. Can't see uh can't see anything working between the two of you. Oh my god. What and you know, I gotta I gotta wonder, uh Joe, um, you know, for Trini, it must have been such a wonderful thing to have his heart lit up again you know, working with somebody. Could you feel that? I think, I think, I think you probably could a lot. I did. Um, I was honored to meet him and, and, and bond like that. And I think what I got from him in the beginning was I, I, I really think um, he respected me for, you know, probably the way I was raised. I give it back to my mom and dad the way they raised me, but his parents were a lot like my parents. So that's why we, we bonded because I mean, think about it. This is a guy 81 that's done world tours. He's been to the white house, the Clint Eastwood movie. He was friends with Clint, Joe Lewis, the boxer, Muhammad Ali, everybody. And here I am. Like I fit in like, why me? I mean, this is like perfect. And he's like, well, it was meant to be. And you know, he always says it'd be a good movie. And we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna turn this into a movie of kind of like Rudy, Steve, that movie where the guy was yeah. too little to play in Notre Dame, but he made it. Yep. Was he a rock star? No. Right. Was he an NFL star? But this story that I'm telling would be a beautiful movie that I'm kind of fishing out there for that to happen. A dreams come true. I love that idea. I, yeah. So it's oh. all kinds of fun stuff that I did with Trini and, uh, the NBC story, um, Manny, the movie guy, asked to do an interview. And he, like you, was honored to meet Trini Lopez. And so what sums up this whole synopsis that we're doing on the show was sitting shoulder to shoulder with Trini Lopez, telling these stories that I'm telling you. And he's nodding his head, and then he points, and, he's, and then he endorses what we're doing. So Manny asked a lot of questions and uh, Trini would always go, how did we meet? I was real. And he'd pop his head and he goes, tell him. I'd go, oh, the story I said was funny. I said, well, I met him at a, an event that he won an award and he asked me to play some songs. I played two and he goes, he slipped me five million in my pocket and I went home that night. It was really nice. And Maddie goes, what? And he goes, kidding, kidding. But Maddie did a great job. This is this is a, a good chunk of that exact interview that Joe was just talking about. It is, again, you see the chemistry between Joe and Trini. Uh, you get a little taste. And again, the Buddy Holly thing, which I didn't know until I researched you and then found that out that Buddy Holly recommended Trini. That's not a bad way to start your music career. Uh, let's go to NBC. It's NBC Palm Springs with Maddie, uh, the movie guy, and Trini and Joe. He has made more than 80 albums, sold millions of copies, appeared in TV and movies, designed Gibson guitars, and even got a shout out from the Golden Girls. Hey, if you could buy a celebrity at an auction, I'd be showering every morning with Trini Lopez. And still, Trini Lopez is not slowing down. I met with a singing icon and Coachella Valley resident, along with his songwriting partner, Joe Chavira, at the historic Club Trinidad. I was born and raised in Dallas, and that's where I got my first uh, person to try to help me with my career, Buddy Holly. At what age? 15, right? I was about 18. 18, okay. 17. Uh -huh. Wow. You're like the Justin Bieber of the time. 
His affiliation with Buddy Holly paved the way to meeting Frank Sinatra, who released his chart-topping records. And that's when I got all those hits. Then Hollywood came calling with countless TV specials and roles in films like The Dirty Dozen. Trini Lopez as Jimenez. He's crawling with hate. Soon, the folk rock artist and guitarist moved to the Coachella Valley and even wrote a song about the desert. Coachella Valley. And it's in the desert where Trini met singer-songwriter Joe Chavira. I just wanted to see him at the Indian Wells Resort and ended up being... Uh, songwriter with him we're like family we business partners and, and everything we've really yeah. gotten like brothers the two collaborate on writing songs and performing even in faraway places like Sri Lanka Everybody's talking about losing and they produced a new CD called a Trini trilogy a three CD set of original songs and Christian music Sony is set to distribute the CD but if you want to buy it now you can go to Trini Lopez music dot net so so the world just it's boom, moving man and moving and you gotta stay with it I think clearly there's no stopping Trina Lopez this coming May 15th he's turning 82 but before that there's my birthday Cinco de Mani and they wish me well happy birthday to Yeah, what a what a fun interview that had to be. That guy seems like he's a local legend, and also the station. I know I worked for NBC years ago too, and know know that station in Palm Springs. But beautiful, another context of you too. Um, you wrote all these songs together. I mean, uh, gosh, fifty original songs or or more with Trini Lopez. What an incredible experience. Um, you also <clears throat> um, collaborated on one of them with um. Uh, lady named Amelia Rose. I don't know how this came about. Maybe give us just a little context of how you guys know each other and then the song uh, Forevermore. What is that about? Okay, Forevermore is a powerful ballad. Um, it kind of has a structure like um, Desperado, where it starts soft and builds strong. Her voice is, is incredible. And she heard the song mm -hmm. and she said, wow, I, uh, we should do something. So a friend videotaped it and basically as you saw it she, here's the thing she only learned it maybe three minutes before we did it she heard it but she oh. looked at the words yeah and she not only didn't she did so good she put the lyrics flat so you can't see her reading it and i right. just go Forever, and we just started singing it out and she just blew doors on it and people just loved it pretty damn beautiful well here is uh, Joe Chavira and lovely Amelia Rose doing a song written by Trini Lopez and Joe Chavira called Forevermore.
Yeah, beautiful duet. You guys really did a beautiful job on that together. And it just shows the power of those songs, um, whether it's you singing them with Trini yourself or with people like Amelia. Beautiful job. Um, you also produced, and I saw um, uh, on one of the um, uh, Trini and Joe um, uh, shows, reality shows, um, the uh, Trini Trilogy. Um, the 3D CC, three CD set that had to be kind of fun. What was the impetus behind the beginning of the Trini trilogy? Well, we started off just doing a couple songs and before I knew it, we had 10 and he said, Hey, you know, let's just do an album. And then before I knew it, 10 didn't stop 12, 14, 18 songs. We had so many songs. We put it like on a double album, but it's on the first one called all original songs. And then he called me up and said, let's do a all original Christmas album, 14 more songs. Then he calls me and said, my friend Elvis did gospel, a great gospel album. Trini had really good faith about his religion, like we're both Catholics. And so we wrote a 14 song Christian song album. So we had all three albums and we were talking about ideas. And I said, how about Trini trilogy? He goes, Oh, Joe, what do you say? What do you do? I like it. And so, boom, <laughs> we released the, the Trinity Trilogy, and it's three CDs of 47 songs in one package. That's, and then we did Here I Am. Oh, just spectacular, yeah. man. I, I just love what you did with him. It's uh, it's so moving, um, not only fun and exciting and enthusiastic, but just moving, uh, the relationship you two had. This is one of my favorite moments with Trini and Joe that uh, that I've seen and, and all the stuff that I've looked, and I've looked at a lot uh, of this gentleman and Trini um, over the last month or two, but this is a beautiful song um, uh, that uh, Trini and Joe wrote. Um, and it really shows Trini being able to kind of express, uh, Joe, you did this, this is why you did it. I mean, it, he's, he's expressing his life, he's expressing his gratefulness for people to, um, to respect him and his career and in his life. This is uh, Trini and Joe, and here I am. And I wanna thank you all for all your support all through the years, from my heart. Adios. <laughs>
the memories do echo loud. My love for life is to hear the crowd sing with me. All my years are my songs from the heart. Here I am. I'll keep singing to the world. Wow. Uh, for a guy who's lived his life with Trini Lopez's name right in the corner of my brain. Um, that's, that's amazing, man. And it really shows what you guys did together and how incredible, uh, that relationship was. I love that. Um, yeah. Um, here's the thing I want to say is Paul Anka. Trini told me that he wrote that song. Everybody knows I did it my way. Sinatra covered it to kind of encompass his life, I guess. Then Albus Trini's other friend, he did it. And so Trini said, Joe, what we got to do is write something about my life, Trini Lopez, mm. but not, I don't want to sing my way. And we, now what, what's unique about that is it became his, his shrine song, so to speak. And when we were recording it, he cried at the very end because oh. he told me all the facts and started writing it. And there's a talking piece at the very end where he goes, I bow my head to my mom and dad. I hope and pray I'll see them someday. And Grandpa Trinidad. And he started to, and I had my head down with the headphones, and he was standing to my right, and he, I heard him, you know, not kind of crack, crack, a, crack a little into a light cry, but crack. And then I just waited till this track is over, and then it goes, here I am. Cut. I looked at him, and he had a little tear in his eye. I said, hey, man, uh, hey, you know, let's get happy again. Uh, you want me to retake it? No. He goes, no, Joe, leave it alone. I want people to hear my heart Ooh. and people to hear it. We, we left it alone. One take it was one take. Oh, and that was it. Here oh, I that's, am. Ma that's magnificent. Wow. And it wasn't, um, how long was that, uh, Joe, before he passed? How long did, did you guys do that before? before? Uh, nine months, a year, if even that. And as as he got closer to uh, August um, and and his last days, there was no real indication that he was ill leading up to to his passing, right? Until he had had to go to the hospital, I would think. Yeah, that's a great conclusion. Is uh, nobody saw it coming. He was healthy. I mean, you know, he was older and he had little issues. But last memory I remember is <clears throat> sitting at his kitchen table, and he kept saying, "Oh, I." I can't swallow the food sometimes. Yes, it wasn't going down right. So we'd go on YouTube and go, home remedies, how to swallow food. <laughs> you know, we'd always come from something. And uh, that's when we wrote up meant to be. I think he was thinking something was up. So on the kitchen table, we wrote a note, Joe, tell the stories of all the things we've done in a title book meant to be. And then we held up the paper and his girlfriend Orly took a picture of me and Trini holding it up about meant to be for, for the book. And uh, so he goes to the hospital and he has complications in his stomach and then things get bad. And on Tuesday, he died August 11th. And on Friday, I called the hospital and they said, he's not responding, but we'll put the phone to Trini's ear. We know who you are. You're the guy that writes songs with him. They said, but he's not responding. He's looking at us, but he's not responding. There's the same thing like my mom in that video. Santa Barbara doctor said, your mom will not respond. And I got her to respond. So she put the phone to his ear on speakerphone. And I didn't know what to do except this. I go, hey, Trini, it's Joe, your amigo, Trini. Hey. And he started to laugh. And the, oh, the nurse, uh, what she heard, all he did is he went, <laughs> hey, Joe, I'm okay. It's the last thing he said to me. Hey, Joe. Oh. And he laughed. I'm okay. And then she goes, I can't believe that. Do it again. So I, we tried it again. He didn't really respond. And then the nurse told the family in Texas about it. And they invited me to the funeral to write and read her eulogy. And I got to sing oh. what I call the last song to Trini's open casket. There was a piano. I didn't know there'd be a piano there. And I sang Heaven's Eyes to Trini, a song we wrote. And right. everybody in the family cry. Ugh. And his sister, who's 90, Lucy said, well, you didn't have a microphone? You sang, now I know why my brother worked with you. He's worked with Frank and Dean and Sammy, but 
I know why my brother worked with you. Don't let people think he was the 60s lemon tree. He did all the way to the end with you for the first time writing a catalog of 50 songs. Trini wrote some originals here and there, but not a catalog. And so that coffin, they had Trini's guitar and the album that you and I love, uh, Trini Live at PJ's. So his sister said, you want to take a picture of me and you holding it? So, oh. you know, I meet him when I had a car accident when I was a kid right. with that album. And then I at his funeral with up that same album. I didn't coordinate that. That was their thing. And what a complete loop of a story of, it almost sounds like fiction, but it's the truth. All of it. Yeah. It's, it's a movie. Yeah. As you were saying, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. there's a, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful story there um, to kind of cap it off in terms of you and Trini, you and um, your nephew did a beautiful uh, short tribute song. What was the, you were talking about going over there for dinner and then jumping into a song and, and uh, it's a beautiful tribute though. What, how did it come about? Well, our family's pretty close and my sister always makes me dinner. You know, I'm single. <laughs> so I go over there to eat and I took my guitar because she likes to hear new songs that I've written. And my nephew had his guitar and we were talking about <clears throat> the good memories of working with Trini. Um, you know, they were saying, well, I bet you really miss him. Because he used to call sometimes when I was at my family's. He'd just call me like late at night and have an idea. And uh, I said, yeah, I really miss him. So I grabbed my guitar and we did a tribute right on the spot. And my sister filmed it. And it was it's that realism, I think, that you don't plan something too much. You just do it like we did that. Trini and I just doing 50 songs. We didn't really plan it. We just did it. And it comes out honest. It comes out real. And the people know when something's real, whether it's a radio broadcast, they can't hear you, see you. They just hear you or they see you. They People know in life when something's real and the whole thing was real. Oh, beautiful. Well, we're going to play a couple minutes of that beautiful tribute that, uh, that Joe got to do with his nephew. What a special moment that had to be, too. Here is Joe Chavira and uh, a tribute to Trini. My name is Joe Shavira. Tonight's a very special night. It's August 29th, Saturday, and at 6.30 tonight on CBS, Trini Lopez and I wrote a song for COVID-19 to help support the food banks during the crisis. Unfortunately, Trini passed away because of COVID-19 on August 11th, Tuesday. My dad also passed away in 2008. I want to dedicate this song to both two men in my life that meant a lot. My dad and Trini Lopez, and are going to help me, my nephew here, Daniel Miller. The song is called Today. And if I said what's on my mind, you can see who I am, but I'm looking back. On my life today
today. Wow, another beautiful moment. Uh, and God, I bet, again, Trini's looking down on that and saying, thanks, man, thanks, thanks. <laughs> or how he did his uh, his uh, his attitude now. Now I have a, I have a whole part of Trini I never knew existed, so I can actually look at him like that now. Um, you wrote this song. Um, tell us a little bit about how this song came about and then go right into it. It was, I guess, one of the last songs you guys wrote. Yeah, about six months before he passed away, uh, he was such a giving guy to the world. Um, he said, why don't we write a song for COVID because it's such a, a huge pandemic worldwide. And we could tell people, Joe, we could warn people to be safe. And and then there's another power to this true story. A hero dies of something he tried to save the world from. Like a captain goes down in a ship with a ship. Trinity and I wrote this song, If By Now. And and then he died of what he was trying to get the message out to help people. And here's the song. The first case of coronavirus has been reported. It's hitting all 50 states. Tested 46 people today for coronavirus. 90% of Americans ordered to stay at home. People feel very isolated. Help is on the way. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I have a dream today. Mommy, I hope Mr. Corona goes away. If by now the world could see, we must all work together in helping out humanity. If by now our nations could be, Bonded together, becoming one big family. Hoping and praying and showing we're caring to help everyone just as much as we can today. Reaching and trying, hopefully finding a cure for this virus to help everyone today. Joe. And you know what? That <clears throat> that seemed to feel so much like the both of you. Um, you know, it, it had you in it. it had, I could see Trini's even singing up there in those days, singing that whole middle part. I mean, it's it's um, it's beautiful. Congratulations on what you were able to discover unexpectedly even over the over these last five years. It it has moved me so deeply to talk to you about Trini. And coming up in 2021, we're here. Um, we're hopefully all turning a corner in a lot of ways. Um, you are continuing this, this Joe, Joey, the jet run on music that has followed you for decades. Um, you've got meant to be, which you were talking about, which is the Trini Lopez and Joe Chavira, Chavira um, biography, which that, does that talk about that talks about your life, your life together for the last five years? Yeah, the book it just was finished last week, but we're going to put pictures in it. Meant to be was again, Trini. When I told him the whole story about 15, you know, and my mom and his birthday is the same date, he just said, Joe, it was meant to be. So I went off that. And to carry his legacy, I want to tell these intimate stories and show videos and, and how we did it, you know. And then yeah. uh, we're also working on a documentary. I might call it Last Song, the last song I played for him at the funeral. And, uh, and from all that, I spun into my album that I wrote 
or uh, called No Reasons. It's on Spotify and all that other stuff. But right. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. I appreciate well, it. You know, and one other thing, which we haven't mentioned yet, the Joe Ch- <clears throat> Chavira magazine. Um, which oh, yeah. Is- I love that. Exciting entertainment news, captivating stories, inspiring accomplishments. You sound like you've got another another facet of life coming out. That's great. In, in brief, how did that come out? Yeah, the magazine, um, within just four weeks of the new year, we did a Christmas special, New Year's special singing, and a Valentine. And then uh, my buddy, Gerald, the drummer, he says, hey, Joe, almost like to turn anything. We should have a <laughs> magazine called. Joe Shavira Magazine, and talk about like what Trini would help people. He helped me help other people. So I just called it joeshaviramagazine.com. It's digital, and it's uh, it, the, the idea is to inspire people to go for their dreams, not only for music, but other things as well. And, um, and it just was completed last night, about 11 at night, and it'll be out online, but we talk about uh, one of the topics is COVID versus music. And the concept is don't let COVID stop your dreams. Do like what we're doing. If you're a talent, write a song for COVID. Express yourself and your talents by it's a problematic situation. So instead of getting mad at it, be its friend. Like, and I wrote If By Now. So it has quotes in there that I'd say, like, you know, go for your dreams, interviews with different people. And it's, I'm excited about it. And then meeting you, uh, I did some research on you. You're pretty uh, good. So we might write <laughs> the Steve song. He's going so strong. I love it. I'll take that any day. Oh, that's that's yeah, great. Yeah. Copyright. How's that? Uh, <laughs> fabulous. I, I love that. And what I do, I also love is the way that the magazine, you described it in their notes, which it will make you sing, smile, spin, and dance with such optimistic happiness. And that seems like it's you, my friend, um, that I you've made me happy just talking about your life, looking at your life with Trini. You're also your amazing turnaround at a young age and being able to get through all that um, intense times. But look, I, I wish you nothing but the best, Joe. You seem like you're an authentic, sincere human who not only uh, has a goal in life, but boy, what a voice. I just love the I love the pipes and I love everything that you're doing. So let's keep Let's keep in touch as this goes along. I'll plug um, I'll plug Joe Chavira on my entire career on living on music, and um, we'll stay in touch. And thanks for sharing some of these really, really special stories, man. Thank you so much, Steve, and your listeners, uh, and uh, who's helping on the other end over there. Thank all right. of you guys. A professional uh, interview, and I have had many, but this is the best. It got to oh. encompass things I never talked about before, so... Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. You bet, man. Thanks very much. We'll we'll be in touch. Okay. Take care, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, my heart is overflowing uh, after that talk with uh, what a sweet guy Joe Chavira is, what a beautiful voice and talent that he is, and also to be able to spend those five years uh, side by side, buddies. I mean, you see those guys in the show? They were like, they're like frat brothers at times. They're just, a, they're goofing around and having fun and it's friggin' Trini Lopez. So uh, thanks so much, Joe Chavira, for letting me in. He gave us some insight on some of those experiences, which he's never done before. So we really appreciate that. And Joe, uh, I know you're going to do fabulously as the years go by. Joey the Jet and Joe Chavira on Living on Music. That was great. Uh, real quick, coming up on Living on Music, this Monday, Black Betty is here. Jenny Langer, the Blues Queen, Blues Hall of Fame member, International Blues Challenge Award winner, whammy winning artist multiple times, singer of the Moonshine Society, the Honey Larks, who are playing with Eric Scott uh, coming up soon at a gig, the Ron Holloway Band, my buddy Ron, um, frequent guests of other band at Berkeley College of Music uh, alumni, which is great. I'm a BU grad, so I love Berkeley so much, and has performed with artists like Warren Haynes, uh, Government Mule, Susan Tedeschi, Derek Trucks, the Nighthawks and more. Jenny Langer is going to bring her blue self to Living on Music on February 15th. On February 22nd, an amazing guy. I watched part of one of his live uh, online virtual uh, shows, kind of variety. It was just fabulous. Extremely talented guy. Jeff Kezi, uh, probably best known for his high profile role as the band leader, keyboardist, and 
producer for Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. But he is a pianist extraordinaire with the powerful piano-driven early Elton Trio. He's toured with Bon Jovi. He's recorded and written with, performed, excuse me, with Roger Waters. That is so cool. Dar Williams, G.E. Smith. This is a really, really talented guy with a heck of a history and a lot of great stories, I'm sure. So please join me on February 22nd for Jeff Kazee. On March 1st, back to the blues. We're with Michael Tash for 25 years. It's been a fixture of the East Coast blues circuit, um, performed all over the place, recently inducted into the Northern Virginia Blues Hall of Fame. And in the 80s, um, he met DC guitarist Steve Jacobs and the band Bad Influence was formed, and they have been going strong since the, the late 80s. What a great group they are. Um, he is one fabulous musician, and again, another chance to delve into the blues. March 1st with Michael Tash. March 8th, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is something else, too. This is uh, and going to be an incredible uh, conversation with the legendary Tom Rush. Tom is an American folk uh, and blues singer and songwriter, Credited by Rolling Stone magazine with ushering in the era of singer-songwriters. So <laughs> that's not a bad um, accolade. Um, James Taylor told Rolling Stone, quote, Tom Rush was not only one of my early heroes, but one of my main influences. Garth Brooks has given Tom the accolade of top five influences. Um, he's championed emerging artists in his entire life back when he recorded music, his early recording recordings of some of this music introduced people to Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, James Taylor, uh, and artists like Nancy Griffith and Sean Colvin have found wider audiences with his Club 47 concerts. This is a pioneer of getting music out there for people and also creating his own stuff. He has a composition called No Regrets, which became a standard um, and has had multiple cover versions. And in March of about 10 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, a video of, of the Remember song that he did has received to date 7 million plays on YouTube. This is a legend of folk and blues and singer songwriting on March 8th, the great Tom Rush on Living on Music. So join me there. This week, real quick on ZTV, tomorrow, Tuesday, reading, writing, Ralph. Ralph Peluso welcomes Courtney Gonzalez and Diana Karsmarsik. I get that moment. I had a great friend growing up named John Kazmarsik. So this is like Karsmarsik, kind of close, I hope. Um, authors, if it's great to be loved. Now, anyone with children in their lives, whether you're a mother, father, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, will appreciate this book. It, it really enhances the learning for kids in an unbiased way. I think you'll really, really like it. That's tomorrow night with Reading, Writing, and Ralph. Uh, Wednesday, uh, the wonderful Dr. Lauren Fisher returns with Wellness Wednesday. She welcomes CJ Wesby, co-owner of Foundations Fitness, and the hashtag of Foundations Fitness is hashtag be your best. Um, and you talk about fitness and life and how you can kind of keep fit, uh, healthy and mind and soul and body. So come and join Lauren Fisher on Wellness Wednesday, uh, Wednesday at seven o'clock. Thursday, another trip into the Alexandra Makers Market with Alyssa Kovac. Uh, she welcomes guest Maritza Maxwell of Hatch. Um, and according to Maritza, that was created to pass along the joy that they have in creating beautiful things, teaching new skills, reinforcing skills that are dormant in us. So another great topic on ZTV. I'm telling you guys, go to Zebra on Facebook right now. I'll wait. No way. Uh, when we're done. Uh, Good News Zebra Facebook page. Hit like. Uh, join us. And you'll get pinged about these shows a lot. Um, you go and find the shows. You hit Get Reminder like on all of our Living on Music invites. And you can catch some of the stuff. These are great shows a lot of great information. Um, it keeps the good news going. There's some reality in there, you know, talking to the musicians. Not everything's good news. Uh, but for the most part, it's all about engaging and bringing you things from around the uh, Northern Virginia area and especially in Alexandria. So catch us uh, on uh, Zebra Facebook for all of the information. And if you want to suggest the topic of a, sh a show or launch a show with us, let us know. Maybe it'll happen. You never know message us. Uh, Living on Music is a production of Zebra Press. Always thanking in perpetuity David McClure for getting ZTV going. Um, Living on Music and Trash or Treasure and probably numerous other things. Uh, Co-producer and editor, the wonderful Lainey Delaney and Zebra Press, pu Press publisher is Mary Wadlin. Love you, Mary. Um, the February 2020 edition of the Zebra newspaper, it's kind of a January, February encompassing edition. It's fabulous. I went through it two or three times so far. Um, and it is great. You can either go get the newspaper. Hey, I love newspapers. Maybe you do too. You can go find it all over Alexandria, outside markets and 
and restaurants and things like that in the big red boxes. You can also read it online at thezebra.org. And if you want to get subscribed to it and get an envelope with the paper in it every month, go online to zebra.org, search subscriptions, and you'll pop right up and you can get it delivered to your house. So that'd be great. And again, remember, you can go to zebra.org for everything the zebra is doing. And we're doing a lot in this area. So you think you want to become a part of it. Got about almost 20,000 um, followers on Facebook and hopefully going to grow that this year. And uh, you can really, really uh, have a, a wonderful time engaging with this area with the zebra, as well as the Good News Zebra Press Facebook page. Once again, coming up, on February 15th, the Blues Queen, Black Betty, otherwise known as Jenny Langer, otherwise known as Black Betty. I am ecstatic to have her on. We'll talk about her incredible blues music career and everything else that's gone on in her life. Until then, especially now, folks, as we're still continuing to deal with everything going on, uh, this thing is waning, but it's not over. So wear a mask, stay distanced, listen to music, live on music, and always be the good news in someone's life. Take care, y'all.